Hallie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aliza. I'm so happy to be here. This is going to be so much fun. Well, I want you to know that um, our team was looking through your social and you have such a great, inspiring way. Um, it really stood out to us. And so we are very much wanting to inspire women. That's what we're doing here on the show. That's what She Speaks How She Does It is all about. So I would love if you could talk a little bit about who you are and what you get to spend your day doing, who you serve. Oh, I love I love that question. And thank you for taking the time to you know look over my, my work that I put out there. Same thing. I've been binging the podcast and I absolutely love the work you do. It's phenomenal and absolutely inspirational. I think more of this sort of content is so relevant and so important for women to really start to prioritize themselves every single day. And even if they just take the 30 minutes or so to listen to a podcast episode, that's tremendous. And by the way, if that takes them three days to listen to it in 10 minute sections, totally good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm all yes. about giving permission, all about giving yes. permission. And that's exactly my mission because I spent so much of my life in this you know, should have, would have, could have, mm. expectation, doing for others. And I was mm. killer at it. I mean, I was the queen of showing up, doing things excellently, mm. following the rules, mm. getting all the gold stars. I just put out a book called Feisty. And I talk about that was my, my, my biggest accomplishment growing up was that I wanted to be this gold star bearing good girl. And that was how I defined myself. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what made me feel good <laughs> Yep. until it didn't until I finally stepped into realizing that always showing up for everyone else, always serving, 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 serving at the cost of my own integrity was really taking away from who I am. And it led me down a path of, you know, massive resentment and anger and frustration. I was very, very disconnected from my being and the other piece of that is that I know I had to walk the path I walked so that I could stand in my purpose today. And I know that my, my soul's purpose, my inner calling is really to teach women, not just how to put on that oxygen mask. Cause I talk about that a lot as well, but why they don't need a permission slip. It is their birthright to fall in love with themselves, to mm -hmm. be in self-love, to reclaim that because we have it when we're born. We lose it along the way and we need to come back to it and reclaim it. And that is what I do spend my days doing, you know, what, you know, the how of how I do it, whether it's making a social media post, whether it's coaching a client, whether it's leading a, a workshop or a group coaching program, all those things are, you know, just kind of like part of the part of the process, which I love doing, but really it's about being in this purpose, in this mission of, we have to change the story. It is our time to change the freaking story. And that's, that's what I'm here to do. Uh, I wrote down what you said. It is our birthright to feel or to fall in love with ourselves. I think that is such an important thing for people to really take to heart because I think you're right. I think we start out with it as a kid because, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're getting the doting and the loving. And then as we get older, we're supposed to shift that and be the doters and the lovers, right? So you're pulling, you're pushing kind of all of that to somebody else as opposed to looking at it. Plus, I think women were so earnest. We want mm -hmm. things to be great. We want everyone to be happy. And I think that that makes us hard on ourselves, right? I mean, how many women do we know? And how many of each, in each of us is, is a perfectionist, like feels like, oh, you know, I didn't, I, I wasn't that good. And if, if that's the story that runs in your head, I, it, that is what you will start to feel. What you tell yourself, the story you tell yourself is how you start to feel about yourself. So Absolutely. I love the work that you do because it puts an emphasis on this idea that we need to take a step back and start to reframe and rethink how we think of how we feel about ourselves. Absolutely. And, and here's the other piece of it, which is we have to accept ourselves. We have to become aware of who we are. We have to learn how to accept ourselves for all of who we are. So I'll give the example that I am, you know, I still struggle with perfectionism. I would love to say that I'm a recovering perfectionist, but I, I maybe I'm in recovery, but it's always a journey. So, you know, perfectionism is part of who I am. Now, there's a lot of positives to being a perfectionist. So let's not downplay that for a minute. I was an excellent student. 
when I first started work, I was in corporate America in business to business sales. I was top of my company. I made a lot of money. I won a lot of trips, had a lot of recognition. Whenever I put something out there professionally or, you know, even in a volunteer capacity, the work that I do is damn good because the perfectionist side of me says, that's how you show up. Now, on the flip side of that, if I focus always on things being perfect, then of course I get stuck in fear and shame and guilt, right? And I don't do anything and I don't take action. Now I used to live in that and I've been able to shift that energy into now I can take action. Now I can understand what's in alignment with myself. And even if it's not perfect, I'll still put it, I'll still put it out there. I'll still take the risk. I'll be vulnerable because I know that I'm going to learn something along the way, but I want to love that side of myself. I want to love on my perfectionist, even when she's taken me down a dark path and got me into trouble. All right. Well, I have um, a couple of follow-up questions on what you're talking about, but I want to start with something you said um, when you started, uh, when you started answering where you talked about shame mm -hmm. and I, I think that shame is such a inhibitor for people. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, this notion of, well, I'm not going to try that because if it doesn't work out, I will feel shame. It like it's, I think so much of what we don't try has some, and what we don't go after mm -hmm. has to do with this fear of what it will say about us and how, how ashamed we will be if it doesn't work out. Can you talk a little bit about shame? the yeah. role it plays and how women can think about overcoming it. Absolutely. And shame is, you know, shame is, is massive. We have to just acknowledge that it exists. I mean, this is really the cornerstone of Brene Brown's work, right? She talks a lot about shame and how do we, how do we overcome it and how do we move past it? And why does it show up? You know, part of it is, is part of our fear mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. The, the old part of our brain, the amygdala has fear to keep us safe. But we don't need to be safe from that proverbial saber-toothed tiger anymore, right? So now we have to figure out how do we reconcile these fearful or shameful thoughts that show up and allow them to be, but also not allow them to rule our lives. So when shame shows up in a situation, the best thing that you can do, and, and this is something that I'm, I hope this audience will resonate with, is if you can just pause, if you can notice that that shame is showing up, and that's maybe the hardest step, truthfully, because we're also conditioned to gloss over the shame, to push it aside, to escape from it, to numb out. Well, I'm just going to have another glass of wine. I'm just going to, you know, go make social plans so I can be with other people and I don't have to sit with that shame. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times have we done that? Mm -hmm. A million, right? Like that's, I, I spent a good chunk of my 20s and 30s in that, in that space. Mm -hmm. And you know, the shame will, will tear us down. It will tear us apart. It will infiltrate our self-talk. And when our self-talk is constantly saying, you're not good enough, you can't do this. Who are you to show up in this way and try to do this thing? So the first thing you need to do is you need to acknowledge that the shame exists. You need to see it. You need to say, okay, shame, I see you. And then you have to get curious. I'm going to keep coming back to that because this curiosity piece is so important. And again, we haven't been told this story that it's okay to get curious about who we are or give ourselves permission, mm. especially as women. We just go, 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 go. And we yeah. don't pause. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad. Okay. So that was the second part of what you were talking about that um, I wanted to probe more on. So the shame. So it sounds like we suffer. This is, we, we suffer because of shame and that the way to try and overcome it is what you're calling the curiosity about yourself. And I think of it, um, when you say that I think self-awareness mm -hmm. and this is another thing that we hear from women. This is a theme on our show that women tell us they struggle with the self-awareness and they, they know that they're a sad, they know that they're feeling stuck. They know that they're happy. They know those things. They don't necessarily know why. Yes. And I would love if you could talk about how 
can we build a practice for self-awareness? I think it's very connected to what you're talking. If I understood you correctly on curiosity about yourself, I think they're very probably the same thing, but how do we tap into what is going on with us be and being curious? How do we do that? Like tell, give us some tips. How do we do it? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, number one tip is you have to choose. You're ready to do it. Mm-hmm. That's the number one tip. And I, I, I say this all the time. You cannot make a change if you don't make the choice, mm-hmm. right? You cannot make the change if you don't make the choice. So once you've chosen, you said, look, I got to figure this out. I'm done living in shame. I'm done living in fear. I'm done not living my very best life. Great. You've made the choice. You need to start to understand who you are. And one of the exercises that I start with, and I've been doing this for years myself, and I do this now with my clients, is going through a core values exercise. And for me, core values, it's not just all your values, right? It's your three to five top, top, top values that help you identify what is most important to you. And all your other values tree up into it. So I, mm-hmm. I pictured it in that way, like a tree. So your, your core values are at the top and all your other values fall somewhere somewhere below that and they, and they overlap and they've got all this connection. So there's a, a practice I go through with my clients with core values where you look at a list of 50 or so core values mm-hmm. and you start to go through and you break it down and you circle which are the ones that instinctively jump out at you. Yeah. Then, you, then you divide those into lists, right? This is the, the have to have them. This is the nice to have. This isn't as important. And you go through this until you break it down to three to five. And once you have those three to five core values, you write them down every single day. Right. Self-awareness begins with repetitive, consistent action, the compound effect, right? Mm-hmm. Small, consistent actions over time equal radical results. So you write them down every day. I write them in my journal. I'm a huge fan of journaling. I highly recommend it to literally everyone, Mm -hmm. but there are people that resist it. Yes. If you resist it, it's okay. I've got a solution for you too. Write those core values on a post-it note, like Mm -hmm. on multiple post-it notes and stick it on your bathroom mirror, stick it on your refrigerator. Yeah. Give people an example of what you mean by core values, because by the way, we talked about this before um, on the show as well, that ultimately you have to be able to figure out what your values are so that you can live to them, right? You can live a life that is in service of those values. Right. What, give us an example of what you mean by values. Yeah. So my core values, I'll, I'll just tell you mine, mine are authenticity, freedom, fun, and love. So those mm-hmm. are my four core values. And if I'm making a decision to do anything in my life, I ask myself, is it in alignment with at least one of those core values? Mm -hmm. Am I being authentic to myself? Is this fun for me to do? Do Mm -hmm. I feel love when Mm -hmm. I do this thing or am with this person? Is this giving me freedom? Yeah. And if I'm not in alignment on any of those points or I'm feeling resistance, then it's not meant for me. So that's how we use the core values, but they have to be top of mind, right? So they drive my decision-making process. They drive how I show up my day, even simple things, right? Like what time am I getting up in the morning? Well, I have to think about, you know, what do I need to do each morning and how can I start my day in the best way for myself? How does that align with my core values, right? Right. This is the guiding principles. Yeah. I am, I am also going to echo your recommendation for journaling. It has absolutely changed my things for me in such a big way when I started to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's what I like about the journaling is that it's an ongoing activity Mm -hmm. that, I mean, I try to do it almost every day. And it, even if you don't feel like journaling, I will start with today. I really don't want to journal. And, and then I just, but I kind of make it a practice to do it. But the, the value of the practice is that I say to myself, I know that I'm doing this so that I can be the best version of myself. And that is important to me. Um, Can you talk though, because one of the things that we've heard about before, we've had um, different guests on who have talked about manifestation. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of confusion about what it is. Can you (laughs) please, because you talk about, uh, you talk about manifesting. Can you talk about what manifesting is and why it's not this sort of pie in the sky thing that sometimes people think it is? I love it. I love it. And I'd love to dispel the myth that manifestation is pie in the sky because manifestation comes back to choosing your desires. 
I always come back to choice. So if you're manifesting something, if you're creating something, it's choosing that I am aligned with whatever it is that you want. So, you know, a lot of people think that manifestation has to do with money and they, they attach it to a material object, a car, a home, a vacation, dollars in your bank account. That's not really it. That's part of it, but that's not really it. So manifestation is about, I am asserting my authentic truth and I am getting in alignment energetically with my desires. And once I, I've made that assertion, now the universe and I can co-create and some magic can happen. Mm -hmm. And you do have to look, if you're very, very, very logical, you might struggle with the idea of magic or, you know, you might have to suspend some disbelief and that's okay. And I would say then that you need to find the language that works for you because we're all doing this all the time. That's yes. the Forget the word manifestation for a minute. Just for a moment, anybody listening, think about something that you've really desired in your life at any point in time. And then when it came through and you're like, well, holy shit, how did that happen? That's amazing. I just did that. I can't believe I just did that. Well, you did it. You made it happen because you made a decision. You allowed yourself to be in that energy. And then you took aligned steps, whether consciously or unconsciously. And then the thing happened. Mm -hmm. and you manifest it. So yeah. that to me is what manifestation is. It's, yeah. it's being in that energy, but it comes down to your self-awareness. If you're not aware and you don't have clarity, you cannot manifest. Yeah. Well, okay. I want to, I want to talk about this idea of the people who are, um, you know, have maybe have a different way of being more rational and how they mm -hmm. think about this. I want to liken it to this. Um, I used to work at a very large company a um, lot of corporate structure, one of the, and so lots of rational thinking, right? Right. One of the most important things we did was strategic planning. Mm -hmm. And what that is, and I want to just kind of w just quickly make this, this analogy, because here you are talking about how people think that manifesting is something that is very like magical and not rational, but if you liken it to a five-year plan, a mm -hmm. three-year plan, a one-year plan, right? The people in, in the most rational people out there spend lots of time and energy doing. They say, they sit down and they say, what do I want things to look like three years from now? What do I want things to look like five years? If you haven't done the thinking of be and being uh, being aware okay i want this Th to me that's kind of a manifesting it's because you're also make put pushing it to the front of your mind you're yeah, saying okay. to yourself I, this is what i want and right. then once you're fully aware oh oh god that's something i want then that's how manifesting starts, right? You just, it, you, you are aware of it because then your actions lead you in that direction. Things that you don't maybe aren't conscious of it, but things lead you in that direction, which is why I always find it so surprising when these very rational people say manifesting is something that makes absolutely no sense to me. And if I can, I'd like to add one really important piece to that because I love this strategic planning example that analogy is brilliant because it's, it's very accessible uh, most of these people most people can understand the idea of a strategic plan even if you haven't worked in corporate you can probably think about it in your family life right mm -hmm. a strategic plan makes sense on many levels for most of us to grasp onto and we have to understand to be able to process this so it's but the the important distinction is when you're making this plan right you have to then feel the energy and feel the emotion of it ahead of the event and that's what's key to success in what you're manifesting. It's not just bringing it to the front of your mind, which is important, but it's also, how will I feel when I reach that goal? How will I feel when I have that thing? When five years comes and now my strategic plan is the reality, how do I feel? And I want you to feel that right now in this moment, meaning you're writing it out, you're getting excited about it. You're getting those like chills and goosebumps, like, ooh, this, found, this feels really good. This feels mm -hmm. really good to envision Mm -hmm. this next level, right? Yeah. This next level version of me, this next level version of my business, whatever it is, that's the next level, but you have to feel it. 
if you're not feeling the emotions, then your mind body connection isn't going to be doing what it needs to be doing. So manifesting 101. Yeah. <laughs> what if for someone who's listening and they just want to try it on their own to start with, where do they start? What should they do? So get centered, right? Like calm your body. You got to connect to your body. You got to calm your nervous system. You can't manifest from a place of chaos and stress and anxiety. That doesn't work. So you got to be in a calm centered space, which I always just like to start with some basic breathing. Very, very simple. Take four to six nice cleansing breaths. Inhale, exhale. That's easy. We can do that anywhere we are. And then just close your eyes for a moment and visualize something that makes you feel really good that you desire. Whatever that might be. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's something new in your home. It could be something really small. Maybe it's a new outfit. Maybe it's, you know, creating a creative opportunity within your life that you haven't had time to pursue previously, or you haven't made time to pursue. So visualize something that makes you feel really good and claim to yourself that this is what you desire and then get behind that energy. So I'm asserting that I want this thing. I desire this thing. And now I'm feeling how good it's going to feel when it happens mm -hmm. and just spend some time on that every single day. Even if you just took 30 seconds or the two minutes while you brush your teeth, for example, and you take those two minutes while you're brushing your teeth and you're looking in the mirror and you're just visualizing whatever it is that you're manifesting and you're feeling the energy of it. When you're done brushing your teeth, you go on with your day. Right. You don't have to do anything else, mm -hmm. but all the, all already you have put into motion the energetic exchange and the ability for your body and your mind to start working together to start making that thing become your reality. Can you talk a little bit about how choice and choosing is integral it, to this whole process? Absolutely. So the, the other piece of this is we have to let go. If we don't choose something one time, okay, so we didn't choose it. Choose again the next time. You know, that's where we tend to hold on to things. So that's one piece is that we have to give ourselves this grace around letting go of past situations that maybe we didn't do the best we could. And that's okay. We can choose again moving forward. So like you said, we have the opportunity to choose every single day, multiple moments throughout the day. We are always making decisions, but we have to think about where do we want to make the decisions and where can we let that go or delegate it to someone else? Because part of the problem with our brains is that our brains can only hold on to so much information at one time. So if we get caught in, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of an indecision loop. Um, I am not. No, okay. but can you explain it? Yeah. So when we're in indecision, as in our brain is mulling something over and we haven't decided. So let's say, for example, you know, something really simple. Maybe you're deciding um, where to go on your next family vacation and you haven't made the decision. So you're, you know, debating the different locations that you might go or how you might travel to get there or what kind of a you know venue you might stay at when you arrive at the place, right? So you're in this indecision. So while you're in indecision on this particular topic, your brain really can't properly handle or process any other important decisions at that time. So you have two choices. You can either close the loop and make the decision for that particular thing or you can table it and say, you know, I don't have a decision yet, but I need a little more time. I'm going to come back to this in about a week and I'll make the decision then. Right. So even mm -hmm. just by doing that, by tabling that decision, you open up the opportunity to make new choices that are relevant right now in this moment. So mm -hmm. that's part of our problem is that we have so much going on in our brains and women think that we can multitask and research shows that we absolutely cannot. And we get inundated and overwhelmed in our minds because there's it's not that we um, don't want to make the choice. It's that we become enabled, uh, disabled rather for making choices. We yeah. can't make the choice because there's too much going on in our minds that we've tried to compartmentalize and we just can't. So we have to start making decisions, moving things off of our plate, delegating, tabling time, and then realizing what needs to be the top of mind decision in that particular moment so that you can make a decision and move on. And once you've made the decision, be done with it. Don't dwell on it. Don't second guess yourself. Don't get stuck into this. Oh, was that the right decision conversation? Which I know I've done that lots of times. And yeah. if I really listen to my instincts and my gut and my own personal analysis, 
you know, I make the best decision I can at the time. Is it always the right decision? No. Most of the time, yes. All the time, no. And that's right. okay. So again, going back to giving yourself grace on, you know, sometimes we don't make the right decision and that is okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and then the other thing that, you know, I think is so um interesting and important about this conversation is that, you know, we as women, we are constantly thinking that we have made bad decisions. Mm -hmm. We're actively thinking, but we're not, but I think it's because we're not necessarily aware of why we're making the decisions when we are making those decisions. Mm -hmm. So then when we look back, we think, oh, we made a bad decision, but it might've been a perfectly great decision at right. the time. At the but time. it's that awareness of yes. giving yourself that grace that you talked about mm -hmm. to say, and that's, I think that's the second thing is when you brought up grace, I thought to myself, this is something that we have to realize that we could have absolutely made this decision for the right reasons at the time we made it. We now have new information. Circumstances change. Things happened that are different that maybe now we would make, we make a different decision. But I think the other thing that I want to end with asking you about is this notion of failure and how it's connect i think it's connected to the idea that we have to give ourselves grace 100% and i like to look at it as failure is feedback mm. right failure it's the same thing you said failure is feedback right it just means that whatever we had tried to do didn't work for some reason or another but in that experience you've learned something right you're going to do it differently the next time and therefore you are winning because when you show up the next time to do something the same or similar, you're going to do it better, differently, even if you fail again, it's mm -hmm. just more feedback. So mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, that's something that w when I started my career, I was in, like I said, I was in business to business sales and there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure to perform, to always be above and beyond your quota, to, you know, be the best. So I felt that pressure. And like I said, being a perfectionist, it, really was very, very difficult for me. It became toxic. I mean, I had a lot of, you know, uh, dis-ease within my body, stress and anxiety and ailments and all the things, but I never would let myself fail at the cost of my health, at the cost of my mental health mm -hmm. and, and the, therefore my physical health, right? They're all, it's all interconnected. But the reality is, in failing, you learn so much more. It's great if you're always winning, but you don't learn anything if you're always winning. So I actually do teach my children that when you fail, it gives you opportunity to do better the next time or do different or get curious or make a different choice. So it's great to win. We all love winning, right? We all want to win. But I also think that in each failure, there's also a win. And that's just part of the feedback. So it's really, it's not so black and white, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's, you had an expected outcome. You didn't attain it for whatever reason, but what did you learn and how can you find a win out of that? So that's how I take failure. And it's so critical for your self-awareness, for your self-love, for your self-talk, for the way that you connect mind, body, spirit, for tapping into your energetic vibration and how you're going to manifest your wildest dreams. I mean, this is all, this is all one big, you know, happy, connected conversation. And I, I love it. I love, I love it because if we can take failure as feedback, we can also move out of shame. We can move yeah. out of shame because we don't have to be ashamed. We don't have yeah. to hold that negative, negative energy. Yeah. Right? Well, and I, I'm so glad that we covered that and, and, and that you also, I, I agree with you. I think that one of the reasons that we are so fearful of failure and don't give ourselves grace is because of the shame and, mm -hmm. and there's, uh, that is something that we have to learn that we can, um, we can look at it from a different perspective and maybe the way we have been looking at it is not the way that serves us. It doesn't right. serve us to look at it that way. Well, Hallie, if people want to 
keep listening to what some of the awesome things that you do. You have tons of great content, as I mentioned at the top. Um, what is the best way for them to do that? Definitely head over to my website, which is just sassyhealthy.fit. And I recommend going to the free resources page because there are several free resources, including 111 journal prompts. So if you're mm -hmm. curious about getting started on your journaling journey, then you can click that and 111 journal prompts under free resources at sassyhealthy.fit. Oh my God, I love that. Thank you. Thank you're you welcome. so much for spending this time with us today and for the work that you're doing. And I love that tip about the 101 um, tips for starting and prompts for journaling, because as we talked about, it's such a gift when you, when you can start doing it. Hallie, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Thank you, Aliza. This has been an absolute pleasure.